Dr. Joseph Strick. Hello. Hope you enjoy this. And while uh, Joseph makes his way down, um, I'll give you a really long, uh, a preamble first question, Joseph, as you're walking, which is, um, I think it's a good, uh, a, good, a good way to start with the end of the film, which is when you watch it. Remember first, re-watching it, I was thinking, what's so controversial about this film? And then you watch that monologue, and you know, 30 years later, it still has the power to shock. Not to shock, to... It feels sort of, um, without being too pretentious, sort of hallucinatory. The, the, the intimacy of it is it, you feel so close to her. And uh, I think maybe that has, has, has part of the power. Was it, what, you know, do, you, do you see it as a, a shocking piece of cinema? Do you have a microphone, actually? I just think it's Joyce. And uh, he, he was such an, a giant that um, I'm in awe today, as I was when I first read it when I was 16. And as I look at it, I think what I could have done better, and I think I could have done a world better, but the, the uh, choice comes through, and I'm very happy about that. And, um, you know, for a director of any sincerity, you, you look at a movie, it's just a parade of mistakes. Oh my God, why did you do that? But in, in this, uh, Molly, in Molly's monologue at the end, it's stuff so powerful that um, if you just let the images breathe with what Joyce is saying, you have a chance of doing something beautiful. And uh, I'm very happy about that. Uh, maybe to, to roll back from the end uh, to the beginning, Ulysses famously, it's 265,000 words of some of the most dense and elusive prose in the history of English literature. Um, what made you think, yeah, I can do this as a film? Well, first of all, when I first read it, I thought it was really something like a screenplay. And I was only 16, and I didn't know what a screenplay was, but I thought this uh, description this is a, a dealing with uh, something very primal. We're getting on here something. For instance, uh, thought, they say in the beginning was the word, no. Joyce, using words, says in the beginning are ideas or images or thoughts. And then we translate it into words. And he has gone so far in giving us the thoughts, the ideas, the images, that there is something stunningly cinema, uh, cinematic about it. Of course, as you know, he uh, was, he wanted to make the film. He uh, worked with Eisenstein and uh, did even ventured into thinking who might play Bloom. And um, he opened the first cinema in Ireland in 1916. It was the only commercial venture. And it just, um, I just felt it was cinema. And why didn't anybody else, why didn't anybody else see that? Uh, did the people who bankrolled it see it as cinema? I think they were hoping I'd make a dirty movie. <laughs> but that it'd be showable. And that's why they wrote a contract in a way that said I had to pass censorship. Well, they knew I was going to do everything I can to retain the spirit and the meaning of choice. And so um, I believe, was there a story that you originally wanted to do as, as a sort of 18 and three quarter hour cut? Yes. <laughs> you know. It's commercial. <laughs> well, if I'd done the 18 and three quarter hour version, there would have been a lot more material in it that the censor would have wanted to take it out because um, there is a lot more there. I think I just did a representative sample. Yeah, sure. 
So, okay, um, one thing that always intrigued me is that uh, the, the book is, is set in you know, June 16th, 1904. It's filmed in Dublin in 1966. Did you ever think uh, I'll, I'll do a period, you know, I'll, I'll shoot it as a period movie? Yes. Um, I thought if Joyce, Joyce took the liberty with uh, two centuries, I could take it with 60 years. And um, I did shoot Portrait of the Artist in period because it had to be in period because it was facing, a peri uh, facing something that changed with the period. But in the case of Ulysses, I felt, and I still do, that there was nothing essential that had changed and that it meant more to shoot it in today. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many people here have, have seen The Savage Eye, which is Joseph's 19... Uh, 58, where is it? Uh, 59. 59 documentary uh, set in Los Angeles. But it's um, it's incredibly, you know, Joycean. Follows this woman, you know, throughout uh, one day with, with a sort of stream of consciousness or a poetic voiceover. Did that sort of prepare you? You know, did, would you maybe did you have that in the back of your mind when you were tackling I'm Ulysses? sure I was influenced by Ulysses. Yeah. But I didn't do the screenplay for The Savage Eye. It was done by Ben Matto. Mm -hmm. But everybody's influenced by Joyce. Welcome to the club. Yeah. So... <laughs> I can't take the credit for the yeah. screenplay or the conception of yeah. The Savage Eye. All yeah. I did was shoot it. Okay, you, you did it well. Um, okay, so a after Ulysses, um, you film it, um, you put it together. At, w at what stage does, did the BBFC or John Trevelyan start saying, we have problems with this? R well, as soon as they saw it. Oh. <laughs> they saw it and they said, uh, no, you can't do this. I'd already had trouble with them on the film of the balcony and on the savage eye yeah. and in both cases they dodged the responsibility by saying oh well these are films of worth but if you can uh, get the London County Council to give it an X then we'll go along with it after we see the critics mm -hmm. and there's been some acceptance and so they were moderately civilized and I did not expect them to come up with the kind of monstrous thing but they knew I had a contract uh, because the chief censor was uh, very much a man about the cinema business. He loved to be taken to lunch, and he loved to be talked to by casting, and everybody thought, oh boy, I'll, I'll get in with him, and then we'll get a little more, you know, a little more skin. And um, <laughs> so I didn't expect him to cut everything he could think of. In fact, one thing he cut he said, I don't know what this is, but I think what, if it is what I think it is, it's got to go. Well, he was right, of course. <laughs> it was the bloody clout thing that is handed by... Uh, because of Gertie McDowell. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So um, that, uh, that meant I had, uh, I had a film in which I had to make 29 cuts, and I, I would have thrown it away first. Yeah. So how did you get around not making the 29 cuts? Well, I uh, announced that... I, uh, I did a version for him. I should say my editor, Reggie Mills, who's a, a strong fellow, made the cuts by just going to black, which is what I told him to do, and a terrible noise on the soundtrack. It was unbearable. <laughs> and so we sent that to the censor, and he called and said, what have you done to your beautiful film? I said, what have, what have I done? What are you trying to do? Uh, that, of course, got me nowhere, but the word leaked out, and uh, I got a call from the BBC. And they said, oh, we'd like to do a program on your movie, and uh, thinking I, I was being a bit arch, I said, well, if you show the cuts, you can do it. They said, okay. Well, they showed it on BBC One, and the, the ground was cut out from under the censor completely. How could they say... It was so horrible if the country had seen it. Yeah, yeah. And so, so the, the story of the cutting, though, continues. I think it goes as far as can, doesn't it? Oh, that, that was different. The three main censorship stories, of, uh, really more than three, but the three most vivid ones are that one and at Cannes. Uh, the film did extremely well, and so it had to be invited to the Cannes Festival. And I knew already that was a crooked racket. Um, everybody in film knows that Cannes is an arranged affair. And but who can resist? <laughs> and so I uh, 
sent them the film and they said, uh, yeah, we're, it's going to win a prize. And I said, well, how can you tell me it's going to win a prize way in advance like this? And they said, well, you see, there are, there are 20 movies and 19 prizes. We know you're going to win. <laughs> okay. And I said, well, you know, there's something very peculiar about this. No film ever wins two prizes. You mean there's never been a best actor and a best camera person in the history of cinema? How can you do that? I mean, in the Academy, you, some, some people get eight or ten awards for one movie only because it's thought to be better. Or else, in the old days, it was everybody was involved with a studio and everybody voted for the Oscars by studio. But that's over now. And now it's 3,000 individual votes. And so um, they, uh, I submitted to the film and uh, submitted them the subtitled version. And the subtitles were all from uh, the uh, version by Valérie uh, uh, Larbeau, which has been approved by the Académie Française, because this was, after all, the great novel of the 20th century, and you had some authority, the French love authority. So they accepted the, the, the version, and on the night it was shown to the public and the jury, they had painstakingly illuminated the subtitles of the 29 cuts with a grease pencil. Rubbed them out. That's a lot of work because it's frame by frame, 24 frames a second times those whole subtitle lengths. And I'm sitting there with my friend Fred Haynes, who collaborated with me. And I said, you take care of the audience and I'm going to go take care of the projection. <laughs> so I went up to the projection room. And there they had a committee of five thugs, all dressed in tuxedos. I said, you can't, you can't show the movie that way. It's not my movie anymore. They said, no, we've decided that's how it's going to be shown. Well, just as it happened, I turned around, and there were all the electrical switches. Well, I, I submit to you, what was I to do? <laughs> Curiosity demanded that I turn them off, so I turned them off. And they grabbed me, threw me out of the projection room and down the steps and broke my foot. I sat there at the bottom of the you are the world's biggest idiot. What did you do? You didn't stop anything. You didn't change anything. You just got your foot broken. Big hero. So I limped back into the auditorium and said, that the projection's over in my bad French. And I said, no, 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 let us see it. Very flattering. I said, well, OK, you can see this. <laughs> then it's retired from the festival. So I took it out of the festival, and the uh, Society of International Film Festivals, whatever it is, then ruled that you could never take a film out once it had been accepted. Oh, anyway, the film, uh, the next and uh, one of the least, one of the worst because it's the most recent, is that it was uh, bought for Austrian television about five, six years ago, and a. Um, they cut out the anti-Semitism stuff. It was the government chain, the government network, cut out the section you saw on anti-Semitism, which ends with the biscuit tin being thrown at Bloom. They cut it out and threw it away and said nothing to anybody. And it was a German film scholar at the uh, German TV station it went to next that said, hey, they've cut out the anti-Semitism stuff. And nothing I could do about it. And when they invited me to uh, the festival a year and a half ago, I, uh, with uh, Savage Eye, I said, uh, I, th I think we should uh, make a statement about this. We should do something. He said, no, no, no. There's no context for it. In other words, I meant, please, go away. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you think that, that, that there's this uh, legacy with um, maybe that, that you, you had to sort of carry from the book? being deemed as controversial, that you know, when you break down what maybe what Trevelyan was cutting, you know, the 1967 was the year of Bonnie and Clyde. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't that shocking, you know, you know, the, the material in it maybe for the time. Do you think you got lumbered, basically, with, with Joyce's bad blood for, for that book? No, he decided to reveal what we think, not only what we say to each other, but, for instance, the thought that you thoughts that are passing through your mind now as we speak. Because you're living a whole entirely different life, mentally. You're doing integral calculus, or you're thinking about a girl you saw, or 
you're thinking of what wretches they are in the Murdoch clan or whatever it is, you are not living the semi-banality of ordinary existence. You're living on at least two planes, probably three, probably the reality and then your stream of consciousness that's a set of thoughts that's passing through your mind and then the subconscious as well, which we won't even go into <laughs> because <laughs> we don't know enough about it. I mean, if you tell me your dreams. <laughs> but um, Joyce said, okay, we're gonna do something with the life of the mind parallel to the reality. Nobody had done it. How marvelous. What a thrill to, to, to be able to do it. And as far as the mechanics of it, I don't pretend that the, the film is as good as the book in any way. I say that every now and then there are moments that are okay, that, that fulfill a uh, Joyce's vision or an equivalence to the Joyce vision. Now the first thing you have to start with then is you're gonna do the book. You're not gonna do some bad screenwriter's version of it. You're gonna do the words. Okay, that's the easy part. Okay, now what, what are the images? And it, as you see, the entire film builds toward the monologue at the end in which all the elements from everything you've seen, all the moments are passing through her mind and ours. And it ends up with a, a totality that is, um, I think, uh, extraordinary. And I find it best when there is some counterpoint in it. That is to say, when the image does not repeat the words, but might be 180 degrees from the words, that's when it's most interesting because then I got you. You're, you're gonna listen to the words because they can be remarkable, but then I'm gonna show an image that is not repetitious of it. For instance, I think one of my favorites is Molly says, uh, I'll uh, read a bit and learn off of, uh, learn off of it by heart so it won't think me stupid. And I can teach him about the other part. I'll make him feel all over till he half faints under me. Note under me, right? <laughs> so, what to do? And I had the idea that um, she's in an optometrist shop getting fancy eyeglasses. I'll learn off a bit by heart. She'll get eyeglasses and look studious. Uh, but they're, they're pointed glasses. And uh, so that you go through the rest of it and then you come to the point where she's gonna kiss him and she almost puts his eye out. That's what I mean by counterpoint. And you seem to appreciate it, so I'm very happy about <laughs> it still. And um, that was the effort throughout, is to not just repeat it, but to enrich it. And goodness, it is rich to yeah. start with. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eula says, it, well, in 67, anyway, it has a nice, well, no, uh, it, has a, it ends up in the Oscars with you. and this, uh, I, I believe you ended up near uh, Warren Beatty? Yes, I was uh, sitting next to, we were nominated, both Warren and I were nominated for um, screenplay adaptations, he for Bonnie and Clyde, and me for Ulysses with Fred Haynes. And uh, the adrenaline's terrible, because you know that your career to change things could become easier. I mean, to this day, when I teach at Salford, University of Salford, they, they, the newspaper said, Oscar winner comes to Salford. Thank you, but you know, can I teach? <laughs> you know, uh, um, so there we are sitting together next to each other. We don't know each other very well and both trying to decide what we're gonna say and I decided I'm gonna say that, um, thank you very much, but this is uh, really all of the words of James Joyce, so on his behalf, I thank you and get off. And I don't know what uh, Warren said, but what I had in mind, but what he said to me was he turned off, obviously full of adrenaline, was shaky. And he said, well, I didn't win. My picture was better than yours. I said, you're crazy. My picture was better than yours. You almost had a fist fight. Over what? Over nothing, over two losers. <laughs> so I said, I'm never gonna go to this again. It's just uh, probably gonna get nominated again. But 
if I do, I'm not going to go. And when I did get nominated again, I sent my daughter, who had done major work on the Mili film, and um, she gave the best speech in the history of the Oscars. She said, thank you, and got off. <laughs> okay, um, before we go on, uh, d do we have any questions in the audience? We do. Uh, do we have microphones? There's uh, oh a right. young lady bearing a microscope. Okay, so maybe start with the lady halfway up, with the hand up. Um, you raise your hand, yeah. making this film now, who would you cast as Molly and as Lillian? Barbara's ghost and Milo's ghost. <laughs> I'd, I'd look, I'd start an entire new op set of open auditions and uh, just pick the best from that. And um, I don't, I, f I have found it more fun to work with unknowns. And uh, that doesn't mean that Known actors can be marvelous. Uh, uh, if you see um, John Gilwood in uh, Portrait of the Artist of a Young Man, you'll see him do the Hellfire sermon so brilliantly that I'm wrong. I'm completely wrong, but I'm just telling you what I'd do. If it's a young person, I would get unknowns. Okay, anyone else? Oh, wow. Um, so maybe on, on this side now, there's some. I just wanted to say hello to Joe Strick. I had the good fortune to work with him on Ulysses. And I wanted to remind him that there was censorship in Ireland as there was in England too. The book was forbidden. But one day when we were pretending to shoot in Bloom's house, there was a knock at the door and it turned out to be a beautiful young nun. And she said, I heard you were filming Ulysses. May I come in and watch you a little? Which, of course, we were very glad to let her in. And she, at the end, she said, thank you very much. I'm a Joyce scholar, and the book was forbidden in Ireland, and she was a joy scholar. Also, we never had any trouble finding uh, permits to shoot. There was always one official who was a Joyce fan um, and uh, gave us the permits we needed. C can you introduce yourself and say what you did on the film? I was the cameraman. That, uh, is, that is Wolfgang Suschitzky. It's a great cameraman and uh, responsible for all the beautiful images you see when you, when I look at the uh, walking along eternity along Sandy Mount Strand, I think of Wolf and the way he shot it, and um, I feel marvelous that we work together. Uh, was it always going to be black and white? Pardon me. Was it always black and white in in your mind? Yes, I, um, there was probably a defect in me, but. I didn't like the um, color processes at the time, and I thought they were too garish. There was a technicolor blue, and there was a there was a hotsy totsy red, and I just thought that I don't want to do that. I want to do it uh, in the beautiful shades of black and white. And I th um, I was a little late in making that decision, but I had Wolfgang, and he made it beautiful. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Right uh, on this side. Two people side by side. Hi. Um, you said that when you watch it now, you, all that goes through your mind is all the things that you do differently. Um, I mean, it's the first time I've seen the film, and I thought it was done stupendously well. But I would be interested, just out of curiosity, to, as a couple of examples of the things that you would now actually have wanted to change or, or do differently. Well, it's an endless list. In fact, it, it includes some elements of many, many shots, but just to give you a, a notion, um, the actress who played the mother, um, wh who's now deceased, I was not able to get to. I was not able to direct her properly. 
it's my fault because I did the auditions, I did the casting, I directed it. So it's not her fault. It's my responsibility. But I never got it. I never got it right with her. And rather than go off endlessly, we reshot it, shooting it out of focus, and somebody else's voice dubbed in. And um, now I know that sounds like a fuzzy dream sequence shot out of focus, and I didn't like the idea either. But I promise you would not have um, liked it. The other easy example is that uh, we were shooting the scene between Mr. Deasy paying Stephen Dedalus, um and um, inside his office. And, it, and then it goes outside to uh, um, Ireland is the only country that never persecuted the Jews. That sequence we were way behind. And there's a very unfortunate thing in uh, independent filmmaking, which means that if you go over a budget, you have a, c you have a completion guarantee, which is an insurance company that um, for 4% of the budget will write a guarantee. And if you go over budget, they would take the film away from you, or they will take the script and tear out 10, 20, 30 pages and say, okay, you finished that script and you, there's nothing you can do about it. And so rather than do that, you end up shooting too fast. And uh, Wolfgang was uh, extraordinary. Uh, it was a rule of the film that when, by the, the lighting would not take any longer than I took to get the actors ready, which is a terrible imposition on a cameraman. And in Hollywood, you may get five setups a day. We had to get 15, perhaps 20. And so everything you see is, uh, is not shot as uh, fully, with as many angles as it could take. Now, Eisenstein, one of the great masters, said that the way you make a film is that you uh, have a scene, you start shooting it from here, you shoot it all there, and you shoot it all there, and you shoot it all there. Oh, in, in different lengths. That is, long shot, and middle shot, and close up there, long shot, middle shot, and close up there, and there, and there, and there. In other words, quadrant uh, in four different directions, at least three camera positions for each of the four directions. Well, uh, I think that's a bit excessive, <laughs> but uh, he made some beautiful films, and um, it can't be argued with. And uh, the first uh, film anybody makes, you're under tremendous pressure to get it done, and if not, you're out. But in this case, I'd made a couple of successful films, but the most time I could get was 12 weeks of shooting. And uh, that's considered a decent schedule, but I'm telling you, it's better if you take longer. And uh, it's not right to whine and moan and groan about it, because when you have somebody like Wolfgang shooting, it uh, he, he makes it look easy, but it's not. Um, that's amazing, though. But 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 the 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 mother, because that's uh, the mother as the ghost, um, is, yes. is one of the most effective scenes in the whole film. Thank you. I suppose I made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, you shouldn't have said that. Okay, so do you want to uh, pass it to the person beside you, I think, had, a, had your hand up here. Uh, Mr. Strick, I was most moved by seeing the film because uh, this is the second time. The first time I saw it was b when I was working back in Dublin in the th 30 years ago, and that time you, you may know that the Irish Film Censorship Board had also banned it on grounds of obscenity, offence to public morals, and uh, against the Catholic Church, so I had to see it in the what was then the Irish Film Society, equivalent to the British Film Institute, and it didn't get a public screening certificate in Ireland until the late 1980s. Now, um, having seen it again, it was extremely moving seeing it the second time uh, here in London, but what I wanted to ask was, you made a brief reference to your reason why you decided not to make um, it in period costume of 1904. Now. Would another possibility have been that there would have been f extra financial costs f f for the production? Not You just said that it had, uh, Dublin hadn't changed much in 60 years, although physically we could see 
buses and factories and new buildings, but were there any financial reasons why you felt that it, it would be difficult to, to make it in the period of 1904? The decision wasn't based on the money. It was based on the, the idea I had that I was going to show that it was super relevant today. That's what, it, that's what the decision came from. The, uh, everything he talks about was true today, and uh, I was um, very intent on saying that. Do you think Joyce knows about women? Pardon me? Joyce and women? Well, it's a sort of a, as time Carl has gone on, it's more controversial. <laughs> Carl Jung said that only the devil himself knows as much about women as Joyce. He said, I certainly don't. <laughs> well, I think he's right. <laughs> Um, anybody else? No. Oh, okay. Um, the film was made in 1967. 66. Um, sorry, 66. Uh, it says 67 in the program. Um, how much did you feel um, a part of or influenced by or affected by um, European cinema of the time? Well, I felt... Um influenced by what I f always felt was the best of cinemas, and it was always international. Uh, it was not only John Ford, but it was uh, Akira Kurosawa. It was Sadia Rai, and uh, it was uh, Jean Vigo. Those are my idols. Oh boy, if I could do anything worthy of being seen in their company, I'd be thrilled. And um, the further condition of that is that when you look at Sadiat Rai's first film, he made it with nothing. Uh, and uh, bare hands, really, and friends. And uh, it's a giant achievement. I think the third of his series, The World of Apu, is one of the most marvelous, one of the great, greatest films made. And I can, I can cry just thinking of the plot, and I don't cry that easily. So the, the, these the, these giants in front of us who uh, show you how to shoot and who overcome everything. Just think the uh, the people like John Ford and William Schaffner and Fred Zinnemann were in the heart of the studio nuttiness, and that was a really nutty period. And they overcame it. They could put up with those people or get along with them enough to get their way. They were much better at that than I was. When I worked for the major studios after Ulysses, I got fired all the time. That's kind of a hint, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I couldn't get along with them because they wouldn't let me make my movie. And those other folks, not Rye, but the others that I mentioned, lived through the studio system and survived it. And it was very hard on them because somebody like John Huston, for instance, quite a filmmaker, um, made the Asphalt Jungle and African Queen and Treasure of the Sierra Madre and all those enormous hits. He made one flop. And he couldn't get the money to make the next movie. Five years. And he lost Portrait of the Artist, which he owned. He couldn't raise half a million bucks to make that film. And it fell out of his control, and I got it that way. And uh, same thing happened to Milos Forman after Hare and Amadeus and Cuckoo's Nest. He made uh, the Valmont, which in competition with Stephen Frears, who preceded him, which died. He could not get another film for five years. And then, and never has been able to command the kind of situation now, that situation is something like this, that it takes a lot of money to buy an evidently extraordinary book or screenplay. Um, you can't start in that game another half a million do dollars. Well, that seems like a high-budget movie to me. <laughs> so um, I'm not in the racket of trying to, uh, to get the kind of books that uh, I have to pay that for. Uh, I wanted to make Sabbath Theater, the uh, Philip Roth book. The agent knew I wasn't going to answer the phone. That's okay. Saved us both a lot of trouble. 
you know, it would be worse if you'd strung me along. And so it's, uh, I'm in a different part of the, the film field, and I don't, I don't mind. I, I've had some luck, and the films have done well. And that's all you can ask. If your work is seen, you can't ask for anything else. But, but also, uh, what the retrospective has shown is, you know, you, 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 your career has taken many paths since Ulysses, but you're also still, you've got, you, you, the film bug hasn't left you, and you, you still, you've got a digital, di digital thing in mind? Yes, the next film I make is going to be with a palm-spiced, high-definition camcorder that will cost 100 quid. And I want to make it with no money, and I want to make it from a, uh, an excellent script, and it's a Fado farce. I love doing comedy and farce. And uh, I uh, want to be able to show that you can make films for nothing, and uh, I want to be part of the encouragement to an enormous amount of new filmmaking by an, a lot of people who will go out and make the films and not look back, because it's now possible this little hundred quid camcorder is as good as most of the mountains of equipment that we bring out to do picture and sound. And a lot of people will fail at it, but the entire field will fail and uh, we will, they will change and become much, much more interesting with a lot more kook cases and uh, activity. As, as somebody that who made Ulysses and with, with Wolfgang, ma you know, made something as aesthetically pleasing as that, do you not worry that, you know, digicamcorders just produce sometimes? Uh, Depends on the talent behind okay. the camera. Very good. It's not what's well spoken. <laughs> <laughs> Wolf could shoot it in a way that would dazzle you. I promise you. Yeah. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing it. Um, okay. On that note, uh, I think, uh, unless I have uh, no, no more questions. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't see the dead. I know the book, and I, I didn't particularly want to because I, oh, I, th I read the screenplay, and I, I saw that he had, um, the way in which he changed it, which is okay. He had every right to do so, but I, um, I, I didn't think he had done what could have been done with it. Okay. And I think he's oh. a giant. Uh, do we have time for one more? Uh, yeah. Mike? Uh, digi camcorder to make a film. Don't you, uh, as you were saying, you don't you need to shoot it from different angles? So you would need several digi cameras? No, you should just use the same camera and shoot. That's the way most films are made. Most films are not made with multiple cameras. They're made with one camera moved from position to position. Mm. Okay. Um, all right. Well, on that note, I think it's, uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking a, a remarkable <laughs> film director.